and welcome to Bible Talk. I'm your host, Kirk, and if this is your first time visiting the channel, I just want to say thank you. I greatly appreciate your stopping by. Uh, the purpose of this channel is to, one, to really encourage people to, as many as possible, to enter into relationship with the living God, the God that we say that we believe in. You know, He wants our love. He wants that relationship. And he did his part to make it possible for us to retain our relationship with him. And that, of course, is through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. I mean, his blood. It's another a subject that we are going to get into and read about. Um, today's lesson is entitled The World That Then Was. Um, it is written in Second Peter 3rd chapter. That's where we're going to start. I will do my best to put notes out because I really want, I want to show you what I believe by showing you what's written in the word. And then we'll look at other pieces of information and try to tie some verses together to help prove out, let the Bible back itself up. Um, I will do, I'm going to take my time and go slow and because um, I don't want to confuse and I want to be as clear and as concise as possible. So I guess let's get started. If you have your tools ready, um, one of the tools would be a Strong's Concordance, a King James version of the Bible, or maybe you could have downloaded the Touch Bible. Uh, it'll be like Touch Bible KJV Plus because it has a Strong's Concordance attached to it. Um, the Companion Study Bible, which... Um, there are links online for PDF versions of the complete Companion Study Bible, so you don't have to go purchase one. You can just go and download the link or just go to the link. I'll put a link in the description. I'll put two. One of them will be um, a link that will show you PDF versions of each page of the Companion Study Bible. So you'll be able to navigate to whatever book you want to, whatever appendix that you want to access. And then the other one, it has the same information, but it looks as though someone went through and they've added, actually there's some notes added um, regarding specific key words that some of which we may even look up ourselves as we get deeper into studying. So, um, like I said, before on previous videos, um, it's okay if we disagree. Um, that's why I'm sharing the information, showing you where I'm getting the information from and, um, and providing notes. So this way you can check it out for yourself and prayerfully consider it and make your own decisions. Okay. No debate. It's just sharing information. All right. With that having been said, I'm going to do this one thing. I'm just going to describe or explain the concepts surrounding, you know, the bigger picture of, you know, the world that then was and why it's important to study or at least be aware of this for to better understand the Bible, because this will take us into Genesis, which will cause us to see Genesis from a slightly different perspective. <clears throat> and so here we go. So this is the, the concept, if you will. In 2 Peter 3rd chapter, it talks about three distinct periods of time or earth ages or what some people will say dispensations. So you have the world that then was, the heavens and the earth which are now, and then you have the new heavens and the new earth. So the world that then was, when God did his creative work, he created everything, the planets, the universe, our spirits. And Paul talks about how we have two bodies. We have a spiritual body and we have a terrestrial or this physical body that we reside in right now. But the thought is this, that at the very beginning, the Lord created all things, created our spirits, and we existed with the Father in spiritual bodies, not, um, and I'm not talking um, reincarnation at this at all. We existed in spiritual bodies with the Father. So Satan rebels against the Father. And there's verses that we'll cover that will talk about his rebellion. 
and he's still at work today. There is a devil <laughs> at work as well. So anyway, Satan rebels against the father and some of us sided with him in that rebellion. So instead of the father destroying his children that he created, he just did away with that earth age or that period of time. Now, during that period of time, the only thing that would have been in flesh would have been the dinosaurs and all the other animal creatures that are found locked in the fossil record. OK, that's why we find their remains. The spiritual bodies that we have were not made of flesh and blood, but they had mass. And so there's different um, Google searches you can do where it talks about footprints, fossilized footprints and along with dinosaur tracks and things like that. Anyway, so the father did away with the world that then was. And then what he does, he regenerates the earth. And now we are born in flesh. Our spirit is placed in a flesh body. That's in that's to be incarnate, not reincarnated. Because to be reincarnated, you're placed in flesh again and again and again. So we're incarnate with no remembrance of the world that then was so that we have this opportunity to freely choose who we're going to serve. And that's the Lord himself, the father, the living God and father of us all, the creator of heaven and earth or the devil. Now, we are living in that second portion where it talks about the the um, heavens and the earth, which are now. And guess what? We do we not look forward to a new heaven and a new earth? And if you your answer is yes, then why would it be so difficult to under, to believe that he did this once before? We're in a winnowing process, like a separating of the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, the good from the bad. We all come this way to make a choice. All right. So we live now. And even in the Bible, it says that there's not going to be any remembrance of the former, like meaning this second earth age period right now. So and then you have the millennium, which is the thousand year reign of Christ. And it talks about him being bound for a thousand. I mean, Satan being bound so he can't interfere. Truth will be taught. Then he's released again to test the nations. And then there'll be that final judgment. But again, there is going to be a new heaven and new earth to come. So there's three distinct periods of time or dispensations or, or, or earth ages, if you will. So if you stuck around for that high level, and like I said, I'm not... You know, maybe I didn't do a good job explaining it, but if you stuck around this long, stick around even longer and then we'll go over some verses and try to tie this all together. OK, so let me get a, a little bit of water. Yeah, yeah. Because that was a mouthful anyway. So here we go. So let's go to Second Peter, the third chapter. That's where we're going to start. And what we're going to do, you know, we're going to take this into small pieces, small pieces. So I'll try not to make this too long. I'll try not to go, you know, too long with it. So this way you can chew on it a little bit and then we'll come back and we'll do the next video. All right. So what I want to do is I want to go to Second Peter, third chapter. Okay, and we may read the first 13 verses or so. And if you're ready, what we have here, this is what it reads. This second epistle, and for those who don't know, the word epistle means letter. So the second letter, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And an apostle is just a messenger or one who's sent forth. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. And scoffers, if we want, if I just hover over this, um, it says derider, a derider, that is to say, a false teacher. Or someone who mocks or scoffs. Um, the second word here, the 1702, because this word comes from another word. 
And it's from this word and it says to jeer at or deride. So if we look up some of these, I mean, we're talking about a false, either false teacher. We're talking about someone that's just making fun or jeering at or deriding. Because what do they say here? This is what they're saying. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So where so their comment that they're making fun of, like, okay, so where is he at? You know, he says he's gonna come, you know, but everything still continues as from the time he created everything. But that's not the case. Uh, the fifth verse says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. Now, I'm going to stop there because that's so now we're talking about the first earth age or the first dispensation of time, if you will. And notice it says here that the heavens were of old. Now, when we go there, if we're just looking at some of the words, uh, the definitions of the words, I won't pronounce them in the Hebrew only because when it comes to um, the closed caption, sometimes it doesn't capture the words. So we're talking about a long, it says long ago or for a long while. And there's, a, and there's some other words that it comes from. If I hover over this, this one, see right here, you notice it talks about sometime since, and it says ancient, ancient. I don't know if you guys see that right there. Ain't ancient, okay? So the earth is pretty old. So let's take a look. Let's let's do this. Let's go to Google. And I kind of got try to get myself ready for this. Um, and we'll just go with um, the age of the earth like, or or how um, old. Oops. Hold on. Sorry. One moment. My mouse is not cooperating how old is the earth and there it is right there 4.543 billion years old that's with a b okay so the earth is ancient it is old and um I, I, I did a, and it even says right here, today we know from radiometric dating, because someone's going to, because I thought the same thing, like, well, how do they know how old the earth is, right? Um, but they did radiometric dating. And you can go ahead and Google that and find out how, what that process looks like. But um, we're saying, scientists are saying that the earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. So then what was the next question that you think popped in my head? I'm like, well, how old is the universe? So let's try that. Let's try that. Well, how old is the universe? It says that we do not know the exact age of the universe, but we believe that it is around 13 billion years, give or take a few billion. And I believe I saw another Google, see, even like down here where it says they're now saying it's probably even 26 billion years old. But who knows? All I know, it's pretty old, ancient, right? So this earth is ancient. Now, the other question was because I, as I stated in my little high level overview, um, I did say that um, the only thing that would have been in flesh would have been dinosaurs and animals that reside that we find in the fossil record billions or millions of years old. So I figured let's go take a look and see um, how long were dinosaurs on the earth. Right. And some of you guys already probably already know this. Yeah, there we go. How, how long were dinosaurs on the earth? And it states here about 165 million years old or, you know, years ago, we'll say. So the Earth is um, 4.5 billion. The universe, 13, approximately 13. Some now say 26 billion. But the dinosaurs were around 165 million. 
So anyway, I just wanted to kind of share that with you. And we'll go back to um, our verses in Second Peter, third chapter. So the earth was old, okay? The heavens were of old and ancient. So we just kind of looked at some information to try to back that up. And then it goes on to say in the fifth verse, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Now, just on the surface, just reading it, just consider this, is that if we talk about the earth standing out of water and it possibly in water, the earth itself, just think about this, two thirds, if not about 70% of this entire planet is submerged underwater. It's covered with water. So that could that could could possibly represent standing in water and also standing out of water because the land mass upon which we occupy is standing out of the water. That's why we got houses and buildings and everything built and we survive above the water. But for standing, I'll, I'm just going to go with the standing out of water with the planet being covered by two thirds of water. Okay. But the standing in water, um, there is a theory, and it's a scientific theory, and it's called the canopy theory. And we're going to go Google that. And so what is believed is that there was a layer of water, of, of water vapor that surrounded the earth out in the atmosphere. So let's go look up canopy theory. And again, this is, you can just Google it. And again, I'm just sharing information to help us to kind of better understand what we're reading or to at least try to show that there's there's information that can outside of the Bible, too, that can kind of help validate some of this stuff. And then we'll let the, the Bible back itself up, too. So let's go um, the canopy theory. Well, actually, I think I already have it pulled up. So I'll just click here. Now, there's other I mean, when you Google it, there's several other um of course, links and that you can click on. I there was a, I got two of them up here, but this first one, it says um, the canopy theory is a scientific explanation and it's re referencing back to Genesis 1, 6. But I'm bringing it out now while we're talking about the world that then was because this water canopy had to exist during this time um, that is spoken of here. So it says, which refers to the waters above the firmament or an expanse in the midst of the waters that will separate the waters from the waters. Now, that was necessary because of the of the event that we're reading about in Second Peter, third chapter, because then by the time we get to Genesis one, God's regenerating the earth. So then he's removing that excess water off the planet. However, we'll continue. Uh, the word firmament or rakia in Hebrew refers to the expanse above the earth, more commonly known as the sky. The Bible makes it clear that this word rakia refers to everything above the earth, the place where the birds fly as well as the place where the planets spin. How did these waters get above the sky and for what purpose? What happened to the waters which were above the firmament? Is there any possible explanation for this phenomenon? These are the questions the canopy theory seeks to answer. I think I'll read the second paragraph here. Um, the canopy theory postulates that these waters above the firmament formed a canopy of water which protected the earth below and may have created a kind of greenhouse effect. The canopy theory usually suggests that it never rained until Noah's flood that the canopy provided needed moisture for the earth. This would explain the lack of interest Noah's contemporaries displayed while Noah was building the ark. Perhaps he warned them of rains and floods as God had promised, but since they had never heard of such a thing or seen it with their own eyes, they were reluctant to believe. In any case, Noah believed God would do what he said, and so Noah built the ark. All right, so let's go back to 2 Peter, third chapter. Okay, so again, the fifth verse, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old or ancient, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, 
whereby the world that then was, this is that first earth age period of time, being overflowed with water, perished. Now, many would think that this word perished is referring to um, Noah's flood, but I would suggest that it's not referring to it because of this, this word perished here. If we take a look at it, it basically says to destroy fully, to perish or lose literally or figuratively. Um, this other word, I never really took a deep look at it. And it says here from a primary alumi to destroy ruin, that is to say death or punishment. And remember, I was saying that the whole reason why the Lord destroyed the first earth age period of time was because of Satan's rebellion against the father. Okay. Now, if we were trying, if now, given the fact that we're, that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished or was destroyed, ruined, then I want to share with you this fact for your consideration. Noah's flood was not was not one to just it did not destroy the earth. It did not destroy the surface of the earth. All it, it was sent to do was to destroy or kill everything that had the breath of life in it, everything that had the breath of life. And so um, I'm going to take you to. Uh, Genesis, the sixth chapter. So let's go to Genesis six. We'll be coming back to the second Peter. And I think I want to go to the seventh verse. Okay, now it goes on to say, well, I'll tell you what, let's just start with the, we'll just start with the first verse because I want to kind of go line by line. I might not expound on everything, but just to get the gist of what's going on here. Genesis chapter six, verse one. And it's, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, uh, that they were fair. And they took them wise of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. And a hundred and twenty years later, that's when the flood came. Um, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And when we go back over these, when we go back to Genesis and do and study the book of Genesis, I'll go deep. We'll go deeper into the, this, this section. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. OK, so um, it was also mentioned, I think, in the 13th verse when the Lord is talking to Noah and the 13th verse, it says, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, this word with here is actually from, I'll just double click on it because you can see it'll say near, hence, generally, with, by, at, among. And so in the King James Version, all these different words that are listed right down here is what's when this Hebrew word is translated. And one of them is from. So it should have been from in this verse, the 13th verse. So it's in line with the, the seventh verse that we read earlier. 
in which the Lord said he's going to destroy them from the earth or from off the earth. Okay, so again, um, the Lord, the, the flood of Noah's day was sent to destroy everything that had the breath of life in it. It wasn't to destroy or ruin the earth at all. That's why when um, Noah sent, when the waters receded after the ark rested on mountains of Ararat, he was able to send out a dove and the dove was able to pluck a leaf off of an olive tree. Now, had it been a had the surface of the earth been ruined and destroyed as the word perished in second Peter um, in second Peter third chapter reads, there wouldn't have been any tree or anything for the bird to bring back to Noah. And there they would have had to wait for new trees and everything to grow, you know, in order to deboard the ark and start anew. All right. So going back to. Second Peter, third chapter. OK, so whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's the first earth age. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And that's yet future. We now reside within that time frame. We're within the heavens and the earth, which are now. And it does talk about, um, I didn't pull out all the, I didn't, I should have added some verses um, in which it talks about the elements melting with fervent heat. And um, it talks about fire, you know, so, and we're going to read some of that, but again, second earth age, this is where we reside now. And like I said, if we can live now believing that there is a new heaven and a new earth to come, and it is written, and it even talks about there not being any remembrance of the former, which would be this earth age right now, the heavens and the earth, which are now that we currently live in. My question again is why I mean, would it be so difficult to believe that he did this once before? Okay, so continuing on with Second Peter, third chapter, and the eighth verse. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. That is called the day of the Lord because one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And that's talking about the millennium, which is a thousand, the thousand year reign of Christ that's written of in um, the book of Revelations. And as I stated earlier, during that time, it does state that Satan will be bound for that thousand year period so that he can't interfere. And then truth will be taught because he's going to be released a second time to test the nations. All right, continuing on. And so it goes on to say in the ninth verse, the Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word. He's being patient with us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance because the wrath of God is going to be poured out. Yes, he's a God of love and mercy and all this loving kindness. And he has our best interest at heart. He wants to bless and he does bless, but we rebelled against him. We sin and sinned against him. And it does say that the wages of sin is death. And there is going to be a day of judgment. There is punishment coming. There is a day of wrath, a day of vengeance. OK, so but but his terms, I mean, he made it possible at his own cost for us to be redeemed or saved from that, from experiencing his wrath and having it poured out upon us. OK, um, and and there is another verse that it says that it says this, that. The, the path, I mean, broad 
and wide. And I probably should. I, I don't know it by. I don't. I know it, but I may not be able to find it. Um, but it's. It reads um, the broad and wide is the path that leads to death, and many are they that find it. But the path that leads, but but narrow and straight is the path that leads to life. And few are they that find it. So although the Lord would that none should perish, and he made it possible for all to men to, you know, to be redeemed, but it's a choice that we have to make. So, but he knows that's not going to be so. It is not going to be so. And I'm going to put this note out there. Uh, there's, there's a set of books called the Apocrypha, that were once in the King James Version Bible. They've been removed. and But you can go get a set. And in when you read these types of books, you know, you, you have to read it prayerfully and, and take what, because some of it, it, it rings like the book of, there's second Ezra um, in there. And there's a part where the Lord is saying that um, although he knows that the majority will be lost. We just talk about the, I mean, the, the, the large number of spirits that he created, children he created, you know, a, the, a good portion of them are going to be lost yet. And yet he's going to rejoice over the, the ones that are not lost, that are saved. And so even that number is a number that can't even be counted. That's how big that population is. But nonetheless, again, the Lord is long suffering. He's patient with us. Um, that long suffering is kind of almost like how you put up with somebody like, come on, you know what I mean? But but it's still patience towards us, you know, not willing that any should perish. Right now, um, the 10th verse says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We don't know when that day will be. Um, we do have to watch, you know, because there are signs that are written about in the word prior to the return of Christ. But many of us probably don't know what we're looking for. It says, um, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So I think at this point, this would probably be a good stopping point. Because again, like I said, I, I want to kind of just take this just a little bit at a time, give you some information, let you review it for yourself, prayerfully consider it, and, and then decide. Um, there's information that we're going to go over and some studies that it's just to help you understand the Bible better or what's being explained historically. And it may even help with some of the prophecies. Um, there's that we, and that's another portion of the Bible is prophetic information. And as I stated earlier, and so that's the, the warnings and, and the predictions and telling us what is yet to come. And then I also said that, you know, you can look at it as a love letter from your father, um, expressing his heart unto us and his, his continual request for us to come unto him. But you'll see that, that that request has often been met with rebellion and the turning of our backs to him. And so oftentimes, if we look over our lives, we'll probably, we could probably see those moments where we may have dishonored him or we may have said or done something to hurt his heart or his feelings. And yet his love, I mean, again, his love is abounding. I mean, it's, and, and we want to be a reflection of that type of love. And that love doesn't mean that, you know, he chastens us when we need to be chastened. Um, he fights, he defends, you know, that doesn't mean you just take, take it on the chin. But anyway, so I'm a, I'll let you guys 
think on this little bit. I will put some notes up to this point um, in the um, description. And then what I'll also do is I'll put I'll put two different links for the Companion Study Bible, and I believe that I could also put a link for the Amplified Bible for those who are interested. And it, like I said, it has um, easier readability. Anyway, so I'm going to close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for being who you are as God. I thank you, Father, for all the wonderful things that you have done. You have been a source of provision. You have been a hedge of protection for many, Lord. I thank you for this moment to come and share your word with my brothers, Lord. And I pray that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive your truths, your words, Lord. And that you will grant wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. For you said that if um, any man lacks wisdom, let him ask it of God. And so I'm asking you, Father, for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding for all those who hear my voice as I petition you on behalf of us all. Please draw near. We love you, Father, and we, we need you. We trust, rely, and depend on you for all things. And I thank you, Lord, for your work of salvation in and through Christ and his blood that covers us, Lord, so that we don't have to experience your wrath. Glorify yourself according to your perfect will throughout the face of this earth, Lord. Correct, chasten, um, teach, Lord, draw men's hearts. This day I pray. Thy will be done, Father, above all that I've even asked of you at this moment. I thank you. I praise you. We love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. So, hey, there you go. Just just the start of the world that then was. Um, I gave you the high level so you kind of know where we're going with this. Um, then we started with some supporting verses regarding... Um, the three earth ages being stated apart. And there's some other verses where it talks about the new heavens and the new earth. Um, we looked up, we considered the age of the earth, the age of the universe, how long were the dinosaurs here? And again, it's just information for you to consider. Um, what I will tell you is this, um, with the next video, um, eventually we should get into Genesis, the first chapter, the first verse. And um, you'll see how the where the world that then was fits into that. It's all tied in with that very, very first verse. Or actually, we probably take the two verses and then we'll make some sense of that second verse. All right. Hey, if the information that you are receiving on this channel uh, is enlightening, inspirational, thought provoking, if you think it has any value at all, All I ask, hey, share, share the link to the channel, Um, uh, subscribe. Um, If you want notifications when, you know, another video is posted, uh, click the bell. Um, If you like it, you can like it. But um, I just really want to reach as many people as possible and um, help. If I help someone, if I even help one person learn how to study their Bible or or help someone to see the living God in a better light to where their heart is drawn unto him all the more. You know, I've done my part. And I and I'm gonna leave you guys with this. There's a verse in the Bible and it says, one man plants, one man waters, but God causes the growth. His desire to have relationship with you is his desire. All he wants is your love. And yes, God could have made us like robots where we're like, no sin, no sin. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. But you have to think about this. He gave us free will. Why? Because love, genuine love, is something that is generated from within out towards someone. So he wants that genuine love. And you can't get that when you force it, when you make uh, someone to obey it, you know, to give it. 
that's not genuine love. So that's what he wants is our love. All right. Hey, so thank you again for joining. And until next time, until next time. And, you know, I think I, this video, I didn't even show up on screen. I'm kind of ashamed. <laughs> I feel kind of bad because I wasn't on at all. Anyway, there you go. Kirk out. <laughs>